Hello, everybody. I am Jake, a.k.a. Bomber, and I welcome you into Jobber Radio's monthly deathmatch rundown. In this video, I'm going to be sharing with you several different things that took place in December 2023 inside the deathmatch world of professional wrestling. I'm talking anything from those five must-see deathmatches that you better not skip over to special happenings that took place in the scene. Three major deathmatch tournaments just wrapped up days ago to close out the year. We're going to take a look at who went home with those trophies. And when it comes to those deathmatch championships, I have you covered in recapping each and every title match from the month. So let's get the final episode of the year started with the Jesus Christ spot of the month. Now, usually this spot is dedicated to some of the most horrendous death defined spots that took place during the month. But in December, I don't think anything had me saying Jesus more than when Santa paid ICW No Holds Barred a visit. During the John Wayne Murdoch and Tara Zett match at No Holds Barred's Volume 56 show, Santa Claus came out to ruin Murdoch's Christmas. As soon as Santa removed his hat, revealing Mick Foley, the crowd lost their minds. He dropped Murdoch with a double arm DDT and whacked him with a barbed wire baseball bat. He helped Tara get the win, and yes, your eyes are not deceiving you. Mick Foley dropped into ICW. He even had a message for the deathmatch wrestlers in the world. I want to send a message out there to every death match wrestler. Don't stop with mittens. Now look, December was a crazy month in the deathmatch scene, but I couldn't think of anything crazier than Mick Foley screwing over John Wayne Murdoch. You may have missed it, but right at the end of the year at Beyond Wrestling, we had a no rope barbed wire death match between Atticus Kogar and yes, Ricky Shane Page. It was a good match. I suggest you watch it. The show is called Heavy Lies the Crown. But as a lot of deathmatch wrestling fans know, Ricky Shane Page stepped away from the deathmatch wrestling world a couple years ago. And yes, we've seen him dabble in hardcore matches, stuff like that in MLW. Yeah, we've seen it, but there was kind of a big announcement that he made during this weekend, the last weekend of 2023. We're gonna look at this tweet that he put out right here. It says, I'm doing my own deathmatch tournament in 2024, doing things the right way. It'll be in the Midwest. I've never been more ready for something in my whole life. That's kind of a big deal. That means Ricky Shane Page is definitely gonna be dabbling in death matches when it comes to 2024, at least by running some shows. That's what we all thought, at least, that we thought, like, oh, maybe he's not going to be in the ma death matches, but he's going to be running some shows. After his match with Atticus Kogar, he got on the mic and said that he's back. He said there's like 10 guys that he is willing to get back in the ring with and do a death match. He said full glass, full bore, straight up death match. So yes, while 2023 was a crazy year overall, there are plenty of things to look forward to because a lot of death match wrestling fans, at least those have been with it and following it throughout the years they all know ricky shane page they all know what he's capable of and this right here these two things it's got to be a reason to be excited but that's it for the deathmatch wrestling news let's get into some actual deathmatch wrestling shall we it's now time we cover three deathmatch tournaments all three took place on december 30th i worked my butt off to get this episode out as fast as i possibly could uh, one tournament had like 15 matches one had 10 matches one had seven or eight matches a lot of matches to cover. I think we should get right into the blood and guts. Let's go. To close out 2023, Game Changer Wrestling held their eighth Nick Gage Invitational in Atlantic City. We got a triple threat opening round match between Masha Slamovich, Emerson Jane, and Risa Sarah. With light tubes hanging above the ring, Sarah started things off by bashing some light tubes over the head of Jane and then suplexing Masha onto some more. Masha showed she wasn't playing around either with this body slam, headshot, 
shot and kick. We got some brutal exchanges from Masha and Jane midway through this match too. Jane would utilize a good mix of slams with her ultra violence, making her really stand out here in this match. There was a flurry of tube shots followed by Sarah showcasing her kendo stick skills. And then we had the staff hand Risa two huge light tube fans to use on her opponents. Slamovich would be able to connect with an air raid crash into the corner and then plant Jane down with the white knight driver to pick up the win though. We got another triple threat match in the first round. This one between Broski, Jimmy Lloyd, Jacob Fatu, and last year's NGI winner, John Wayne Murdoch. I don't think it's a stretch to say that Jacob Fatu really stole this match. He brought the speed, the high flying, the intensity, the strength, and most of all, the ultra violence. Murdoch and Jimmy both got caught up in the spider web of barbed wire after a Russian leg sweep. Lloyd would then later be sandwiched between two barbed wire doors, allowing Fatu to land a moonsault right on top of him. It would be Murdoch who would outsmart Fatu, moving out of the way, sending him crashing to the outside through a couple doors. He then quickly pulled Jimmy over to the corner to connect with his Deep South Destroyer to collect the three count and the victory. That gave me some flashbacks to their first round match back at Tournament of Death 18 in 2019. Now down to just one-on-one -on -one matches for the rest of the tournament, Shane Mercer came out to fill in for Daiju Wakamatsu, who had travel issues. He would be taking on Muedo Extremo. These two put on a really solid opening round match, seeing them both rip each other to shreds with Tokyo Towers. I swear to God, I talk about Mercer's impressive strength every time I watch him wrestle. But look at this, just military pressing Muedo with just one arm at one point. He's just insane. He used his trademark sharp whip thing to torture Muedo several times during this match. A shotgun dropkick into the corner brought Muedo right back into this match, though, after being brutalized pretty much all the way through. That's when a light tube and carpet trip log cabin was ushered into the middle of the ring as Muedo looked to make this big comeback. He would bring Shane off the turnbuckle, crashing down into the cabin with a gigantic power bomb to land him the win. In the final match of the first round, we were treated to the match that stole the tournament, in my opinion. It would be between Ciclope and Vilento Jack. Jack jump-started this match, and these two were off to the races. There were so many ultra-violent moments here, I'm gonna just rapid-fire some of them off to you, just so you can get most of them. Ciclope was driven back first through a pane of glass with ornaments on him. Jack had his head curb-stomped down onto a skewer board, and then had his knee impaled with skewers after this cannonball in the corner. Jack then took a spine buster onto barbed wire, as well as a sidewalk slam through glass and cut soda cans onto the concrete floor. He then took Took this frog splash from Ciclope, rolled right through it, and hit a brain buster on him. Ciclope then nearly took Jack's head off with this shining wizard and then caved it in with a Canadian destroyer. Jack then drove Ciclope down onto some cut soda cans with a sit-out powerbomb. He busted an unopened bottle of Corona over Ciclope's head and then finished him off with a package pile driver. I know I just flew through this match, but you gotta believe me, it was a very, very good match here. But to me, one of the most impressive parts of the whole thing was the fact that Ciclope was able to keep his headphones on around his neck the entire time. So on to round two now, Masha Slamovich looked like a woman possessed coming to the ring to take on the Duke of Hardcore, John Wayne Murdoch. And wow, Masha beat the hell out of Murdoch for much of this match. And just as expected, Murdoch would break out some dirty tactics at points, but Masha stayed right in there with him, especially after dropping him back first onto these tubes. Masha tore away at his mouth using a sickle, and just when it looked like she was about to move on to the finals, she slipped up. She took a long time to get a door and panes of glass stacked up in the ring. That's where she used lighter fluid to light the door on fire. Murdoch easily countered with a Deep South Destroyer, sending her head first through it all. He would go on to pick up the win, sending himself to the finals back to back years. To see who would face him though, Vilento Jack would take on a very pissed off Muedo Extremo. You see, Extremo didn't take too kindly to Jack attacking Ciclope after their first round match, so he did his best to dish out some payback. A power drill seemed to do the trick. Eventually though, Jack would take control of the drill and the match. Then just like in round one, Muedo Extremo began to take on a lot of damage. After falling behind yet again, the fans gave Muedo their full support willing him on in this match. 
Oh, but Violento Jack made it clear he didn't care about what the fans wanted, though. Jack landed a nice wonton bomb, but Bueno jumped right up, bringing Jack down with a tough German suplex. Cyclope would run down to the ring to get revenge on Jack, smashing a bottle of Corona over his head this time. That's where Bueno would climb up the ladder, hitting a big swanton of his own, and he got the three count. Bueno Extremo pulls off a shocking win, sending him to the finals. And to the finals we go. You know, a lot of people could have predicted John Wade Murdoch to be here, but not a lot of fans predicted this. After two grueling come from behind wins, Mueno Extremo enters the finals with a full crowd rooting him on. All of this would be taking place in a glass ceiling 2.0 death match where these two immediately went for light tubes. They would actually clear an entire row of light tubes in just a matter of seconds. And then after starting to clear the other row of tubes, Mueno would set up a door bridge in the middle of the ring. Now, while he was doing that, Murdoch climbed his way up to the top of the scaffold where Extremo soon followed. They jockeyed for position for a moment before Murdoch just chucked Mueno down through the glass ceiling, sending him crashing to the mat below. Now keep in mind, all of this took place just a couple minutes into the match. And I say that probably helped Mueno kick out because nobody expected him to shoot up after a one count. He would eat several more light tube bundles, but seemed completely unfazed. He would plant Murdoch down with a blue thunder bomb, but he kicked out right at one as well. The intensity was electric as they just continued to destroy one another. Panes of glass were stacked up where Mueno drove Murdoch down through them with a power bomb. One, two, three. Mueno Extremo wins the eighth Nick Gage Invitational. He was down early every single match, but fought his way back, winning the entire tournament. Afterwards, his partner, Cyclope, joined him in celebrating this huge win in his career as the crowd gave him all of their love. ICW No Holds Barred held their SPO's Battle of the Tough Guys 3, which was a two-event tournament all taking place on December 30th. 16 competitors, 15 matches to cover. We need to jump right into it. Match one saw H2O Tag Team Champion Malcolm Monroe III taking on a GCW Tag Team Champion Kevin Koo. We got a crazy kick exchange followed by a shoulder block exchange, followed by a strike exchange, followed by a door headshot exchange. Things were looking up for MM3 after driving Koo through some doors and bringing him down across this steel chair, but this counter suplex onto these chairs put an end to Malcolm's back and the match. Kevin Koo wins, moving on. Two guys Guys who are very familiar with each other were up next when Christian Ross took on Chris Bradley. Bradley almost KO'd Ross right out of the gate with his chair shot. You know, in fact, chair luck was not on Ross's side in this one. Bradley got the worst of this cinder block collision and then took a DVD through a door, allowing Ross to pick up the victory. Some high-end grapplers were up next when Matt Mikowski took on Dominic Garini. And just as expected, we saw a lot of grappling here. They did mix in some hard strikes with some high High impact moves to keep one another on their toes though. They even broke out some geese at one point in the match. Garini made a critical mistake by diving into this door with Mikowski on his back, but he ended up knocking himself loopy by going in head first. Mikowski was able to capitalize with a rear naked choke and then used his gi to just choke Garini out. Matt Mikowski advances. Bojack would be coming out to the ring next to take on last year's Battle of the Tough Guys winner and the ICW American Deathmatch champion, Hoodfoot. Now, Hoodfoot stated he wanted to defend his title throughout the entire tournament, so this would in fact be for the title. The champ struggled to get Bojack up for his Ghostbuster and took a bunch of punishment throughout this match because of it. After possibly getting concussed with these sign shots, Hoodfoot would outmaneuver Bojack, sending him flying through a door in the corner. After trying and failing all match to hit that Ghostbuster, Hoodfoot would finally be able to get his challenger up and planted him down to the mat to secure the win. Hoodfoot remains champion as he advances to the next round. Hardway Heater made his second Battle of the Tough Guys appearance, taking on Tommy Vendetta. I like how some of these cookie sheet shots had Vendetta doing his best shaggy impression as he tried to maintain consciousness. Heater seemed to have his way with Tommy throughout this whole match here, but after pulling Hardway's shirt over his face, he was chucked into a door, and then Tommy pulled out his pile driver directly onto the H2O Tag Team title. So even after getting very little offense in, Tommy moves on to the next round. Next out, we would have Brandon and Kirk taking on Colby Carino in the first round. And you know what? These two had one of the better matches in the entire tournament, seeing Carino flying all over the cage. Kirk was flying too, but not in a good way. Even with his unorthodox style, you can't expect to win after being body slammed onto cinder blocks. 
Then again, caving in your opponent's skull and sternum with said center blocks does have its advantages. Colby fell from the cage down through a door, but was still able to get up and land a Styles Clash onto a bed of chairs. And speaking of chairs, good God, Colby was almost impaled with his choke slam. Kirk then landed his psycho driver, fuck your life, to get the win. A couple of AIW mainstays faced off in the next match as Kaplan took on Joshua Bishop. There was a bunch of chair shots in this one, as well as numerous clubbing blows with neither man coming out on top. If those early chair shots weren't enough, they took turns just chucking steel chairs at one another. Bishop was able to power Kaplan up just enough to drop him on his head through a door. While that slam would not put an end to the match, this one through the doors and chairs would. Kaplan takes the three count victory. In the final match of the opening round, Jaden Newman would try once again to take down the killdozer, Matt Tremont. As Jaden stuck gusset plates into the head of the killdozer, all he seemed to do was laugh it off. In fact, the more the killdozer bled, the more he laughed. Jaden was not laughing though, as he took a high back body drop onto these thumbtacks. And Jaden knew that he had to hit a home run to get this win. So he went to town, not only on Tremont's head, but his face with these thumbtack bat shots. He landed a kick and whipped the killdozer down with this slam to pick up a bracket busting shocker of a victory. So yeah, believe it or not, Jaden Newman advances past the killdozer. It's time for round number two. Hoodfoot will be putting his American Deathmatch title on the line again. This time, it would be against Christian Ross. The challenger would get a little bit of offense in, but Hoodfoot shook it off, delivering his Ghostbuster through a door to pick up a quick second round win. Matt Mikowski was tasked next to take on Jaden Newman. Mikowski blinded Jaden with a trash can, using it to dish out a ton of strikes, but that wouldn't keep him down for long. He hit a shotgun kick, sending Mikowski through a door, and then countered Matt with a lightning quick slam to take home the win, moving on to the third round. Brandon Kirk came out next to face the lovable psychopath, Tommy Vendetta. Kirk would counter the backpack cannonball, sending Tommy into the cage, but unlike his first round match, Tommy would be able to dish out a lot of punishment here. He hit his pile driver once, but then looked to hit it a second time onto a stack of chairs, but that would cost him dearly. Brandon hit a low blow on Tommy and brought him down head first through the chairs with a brutal looking psycho driver fuck your life. He wasn't done though, he chokeslammed Tommy onto the remaining chairs. Instead of pinning him right then and there, Kirk allowed Tommy to make a comeback, this time hitting a backpack pile driver three door and then hitting two more of his pile drivers. As he went for that trifecta though, Kirk rolled him up, stealing the match with a three count victory. Kaplan would come out next to take on Kevin Koo. Koo would land some of those brutal strikes that he's known for, but if anybody can take a hit and keep on going, it's Kaplan. He slammed Koo into the cage with a fallaway slam, but it would be this powerful lariat that would actually put Kevin Koo away in perhaps another upset in the tournament, Kaplan moves past Koo. We are now into round three and we are down to the final four tough guys in the tournament. Jaden Newman was out first to take on Brandon Kirk, who actually made it to the semifinals last year before losing to Hoodfoot. Jaden hit a tornado DDT using the side of the cage, and then he tried taking Brandon out quickly with that same snap slam that won the previous two rounds, but Brandon kicked out. As Brandon took control, he connected with a DVD, but pulled Jaden off the mat before the three getting cocky. Kirk then went for the psycho driver, fuck your life, but Newman countered that with a small package, taking the three count. Jade Newman has smashed any and all brackets out there as he moves on to the finals. Hoodfoot would be putting the American Deathmatch title on the line for a third time in this tournament. This time, it would be against Kaplan. It took less than two minutes for Hoodfoot to hit two Ghostbusters to take the win. So Hoodfoot makes it to the final round back-to-back -back years. This time, he's going to be taking on Jaden Newman. Newman buried the champ under debris to start this match off. Looking to become that new champion, Jaden stuck gusset plates into the back of Hoodfoot's head and then stomped one down onto his hand. Gonna be honest here, things were not looking good for Hoodfoot to repeat. Even after coming close to passing out, Hoodfoot stuck in there and showed he has just enough left to get the job done. It would take a hard hitting headbutt that took Jaden off his feet and then Hoodfoot connected with that Ghostbuster to put him down for good. Hoodfoot takes the win, securing back to back battle of the tough guy victories and on top of that he also defended his title four times in a single day in a single tournament it does not get much tougher than that
On December 30th, Circle Six hosted King of the Death Matches 2023, becoming the fourth company to host a tournament by that same name. Starting the tournament off, we had a blunt force trauma match featuring AJ Gray and a very scary version of Otis Kogar. Blunt force trauma was right. I mean, listen to some of these shots. Fired in by Gray. Oh! Taking it, it. But Stenson took out his plan oh! cast. Oh! oh my oh! fucking god! Not only did we see skulls getting cracked, Otis was also slammed right onto this bed of cinder blocks as AJ was slammed down onto a set of chairs. AJ Gray showed his toughness even after being carved up with straight razors to wrap a chair around the throat of Otis and pull back on it, choking him out. With Otis's body being bent back like that, he was unable to breathe. As he went limp, the ref was forced to call for the bell, meaning AJ Gray will be moving on to round number two. The Bev, Bobby Bev came out next to take on a man who almost severely injured him earlier this year, Mal. Beverly had a hard time keeping up with Mal's speed in this match, as Mal also did a good job adjusting to the ultraviolet setting that he's just not used to. The Bev brought Mal down through a chair with a suplex, but soon would take a scary looking tiger driver through a whole group of chairs. You gotta give it up for Mal though, who showed some innovative counters in this match. He did try to introduce skewers into this thing, but that backfired on him. He tried fighting back, looking to pull off an upset here, but in the end, a missed high risk maneuver led to a series of events which would lead to the downfall of Mal. Beverly hit that Fisherman's DDT on the tubes to get the three count. Great effort here from Mal, but the Bev advances. Dale Patricks came out looking to handle business in the next match, while his opponent Nate Webb came out singing and dancing with the fans. I don't know about you, but I don't think Dale appreciated that very much. They didn't waste time getting to the glass as both guys took shots at one another. Now, Webb was laid across a table in the ring as Dale started to scale a ladder set up beside him. Webb would jump off the table, shoving the ladder over, sending Dale flying outside of the ring, crashing through two other tables. Webb got Patrick's back in the ring and climbed the ladder himself, hitting a frog splash, but it wouldn't be enough. He tried going for another high-risk move, but this time Patrick's got his feet up, countering a moonsault. Patrick's would capitalize with a Tiger Driver to take the win, moving him on to the next round. A dog collar match was on tap as Orin Vite would be tethered to Adam Priest. Now, Priest is not very versed in the deathmatch world. You can tell because he tried his best to stay away from Vite, who would just beat on him throughout this match. I mean, even a trash can lid almost seemed to knock Priest out. Now, that being said, Priest did have a genius counter to an assault driver by pulling the chain into the eyes of Vite. With Orin laying on the ring apron, Priest would be perched on the top rope, not a good place to be when you're connected to your opponent. Orin yanked Priest off the top, sending him crashing down hard through a couple doors to the floor. Now, Orin had a pane of glass set up in the corner, but as he threatened to put Priest through it, Priest just tapped out, giving up. The chicken move drew a lot of booze from the crowd as Orin moves on. Pagano would be out next to take on Dr. Redacted in an ultra-violent casket match. Redacted thought he outsmarted Pagano with this tube shot to the head, but that wasn't about to stop Pagano from diving out of the ring, wiping his opponent out. Redacted would later answer with a dive of his own in the corner. Later, the doc would knock Pagano back into the casket, but would be unable to shut the lid. He would try for a dive, but would get caught and take a backbreaker, followed immediately by a blow to the back of the head. Pagano would then slam the lid down, securing himself the win. In the last match of round number one, Journey Fatu entered the tournament to take on Atticus Kogar, who claims this tournament is his death sentence. Journey set the pace early for this match, having his way with Atticus at times. Fatu would hit a nice splash, but not all of his dives worked out in his favor. Then Atticus broke out the skewers, sticking them all over Fatu's body, including in his freaking mouth. Journey would hit a pop-up powerbomb and then pulled his pants down, looking to give his opponent a little stink face. Little did he know he would catch a cluster of skewers square in his right cheek. But that didn't stop him from still landing that hip attack, though. Kogar would counter Fatu by smashing two bundles of light tubes over his head in the corner of the ring. He would join him on the top rope and bring him crashing down head first with a headlock driver into even more tubes. That would be the end, folks. Atticus Kogar brings home the win, moving on to the next round. Starting off round number two, Dale Patricks and AJ Gray would dip their tape fist in glass for a Taipei deathmatch. They would brawl all over the outside of the ring, seeing 
Patrick's knock a bucket off the head of AJ. Not slowing down, Patrick's would also suplex AJ onto a line of broken glass on the floor. Then we got a bit of a head scratcher moment where Dale would set up a pane of glass on chairs and then sprinkle even more glass down on top of it. I mean, it's new. Either way, AJ was able to counter with a sky high superplex, driving Patrick's down through the glass on glass. Now Dale would be able to kick out of that, but he found himself locked right into AJ Gray's submission. As Dale faded away just as Otis did in the first round, the ref called for the bell, meaning AJ Gray is headed to the finals. The Tokyo Towers were brought to the ring next as Bobby Beverly faced off against Orin Veidt in round two action. This match was just filled with light tubes. If they weren't being bashed over each other's skulls, they were being slammed onto them. Outside of the ring, Orin looked comfortable doing everything he wanted to his opponent. For a while inside of the ring, we got more of the same with Orin taking the Bev out with an assault driver through one of those huge Tokyo Towers. Bobby fought off a second assault driver, but still ended up taking a bundle to the face. We got counters on counters though, as Beverly laid Orin out with a cross body here. Even more light tubes came into play as Orin hit another total anarchy onto Beverly. Beverly kicked out and just this moment of surprise was all it took to cost Orin the match. Beverly rolled him over to take the three count win. That means Orin Veidt takes the exit from the tournament as the Bev moves on to the finals. We have one more match in the second round as Atticus Kogar would go one on one, with Pagano. Early on, Pagano would miss the senton to the outside, landing very hard. After landing hard on his tailbone, I'm not sure if he even fully recovered here. He was able to battle on throughout this match, but you could tell he just wasn't 100%. Atticus did his best to capitalize everywhere he could, but Pagano, believe it or not, controlled the majority of this match still. Even showing signs of it being difficult to move, Pagano was able to still land a nice looking Spanish fly on Kogar. Atticus would counter a wheelbarrow into a bulldog and then drove Pagano's head down into the mat again with this headlock driver to put it into the match. So with that, the triple threat elimination House of Doom 3D finals are set. We have Atticus Kogar versus fellow 440 member Bobby Beverly versus AJ Gray. Finding himself the odd man out of 440, AJ Gray was double teamed from the get go. Now, if two on one wasn't enough, Otis was summoned by his brother to get involved as well. As 440 removed the canvas of the ring, exposing the wooden boards, they took their eyes off of AJ Gray, who let loose on him with a dozen light tubes. Take a minute, look at those trash cans filled with seemingly hundreds of light tubes. Eventually, the numbers would be too much for AJ as they tossed him out of the ring clear into the fans' chairs. I don't even know if I'm doing this justice because this became hard to watch as this continued as a now three on one complete and total beatdown. They just took turns tearing away AJ's flesh. What happened next was just about as close as murder as you can get. Outside the ring, they pulled AJ up onto these ladders so they could bring him down with a double suplex through panes of glass onto the hard floor below. Bobby rolled a lifeless AJ Gray into the ring, finally eliminating him from this match. Now forced to fight, Atticus caught Bobby from behind with his headlock driver, but he wasn't able to steal the win. Bobby thought about skewering his stable mate, but even after Atticus just played him dirty, the Bev tossed the skewers away. He then hit his fisherman's DDT, penning Atticus in the middle of the ring. Ladies and gentlemen, Bobby Beverly takes his trophy, becoming the king of the death matches in 2023. So yeah, I kind of separated Circle Six as King of the Death matches separate from like the IWA Mid-South ones. But throughout the entire tournament, they've referenced this one kind of added on to the other ones. I don't know yet. We're going to see over on JobberRadio.com. It's going to be separated, but I don't know. Maybe they worked out a deal with Ian. I, I don't have no clue what's going on with that, but we'll see what happens right now. I have it Circle Six King of the Death matches 2023 separate from all the other ones. I don't know if. Bobby Beverly is going to be added to the list of other King of the Death matches winners because obviously XPW has their own thing and there was a different Japanese one. So I don't know. Anyway, let's talk about some death match titles on top of those three big tournaments. There was a lot of death match titles on the line here in December to close out the year. So let's just see who finished 2023 going into 2024 with the gold on December 9th. Ruthless Pro Wrestling held their whiteout no ring death match show in Dearborn, Michigan. Kicking off the show, Remington Roar would be attempting to make his first ever defense of his newly won RPW Kamikaze Championship that he won back in October. His opponent would be the wife of the man he took the title from, Randy West. 
With the ambush, Randy took early advantage with light tubes and nails, but the champ would end up returning the favor tenfold though. Now, just like their match back in June, Roar would display his full on strength advantage here, making Randy pay big time. But if you remember, Randy ended up winning that match and after going for his eyes here, she battled back looking like the favorite to get the win. She even found a weed whacker, which somehow found its way into a skate park and rammed it into the back of the champ twice. Roar would catch Randy going for another dive and powered her up onto his shoulder so he could drive her down through this door to finish her off. Remington Roar finally gets a win over Randy West, making him 1-3 against her in his career, and that means he also will be walking away into 2024, your RPW Kamikaze Champion. Heading over to the main event of that RPW Whiteout show, Tommy Vendetta would be tasked with trying to defend his newly won Rust Belt Championship against one of the best, no ring deathmatch wrestlers in the entire world, we're talking Casanova Valentine. And just because he knows it gets under the fan's skin, Tommy would of course be sporting a hoodie to start this match off. Hoodie or not though, Casanova utilized the fans to his benefit with the help of a couple skateboards that he found laying around. The layers of protection would be peeled off of the champion as Valentine body slammed him onto a thumbtack skateboard, followed then by a light tube skateboard. Even though Tommy would manage to slide his shirt back on, he still ate several light tubes to the head, as well as a hockey stick down low. After Casanova dominated a solid portion of this match, Tommy would find a staple gun laying around to help turn the tide. He then lashed out at his challenger, drilling him with every single thing he could get his hands on. While going on this tirade, Tommy seems to have overestimated his strength just a little bit, trying to powerbomb Casanova, but he took a belly-to-belly -belly through a door as punishment. We got a little more fan participation before we saw the champion uh, impaled on a forward object. Looking to close out the match, Vendetta stepped up onto a ramp, but that's where he caught a bundle of light tubes to the head. Casanova locked in the claw, going for his trademark slam, but Vendetta countered by sliding down the ramp, rolling the challenger up for a surprise three count victory. Casanova was left shocked as Tommy Vendetta sneaks away with the victory, making his first successful RPW Rust Belt title defense. On December 10th, GCW traveled down to Mexico to do a joint show with Zona 23 in the junkyard. That is where GCW ultra-violent champion Rina Yamashita put her title on the line against another deathmatch veteran, Ludark Shatan. A little technical wrestling got things started off, but it wouldn't be long before a barbed wire chair was introduced. Now with this match being in a junkyard, you knew it would only be a matter of time before the fight spilled outside of the ring and over towards junk cars. Rina hit a nice looking suplex caving in the top of this car. Ludark tried her best to drive the champ through the windshield, but then missed this senton costing her big time. Back in the ring, Rina gave Ludark a free chair shot only for her to take it like the champ that she is. Rina would then flip her challenger up into the air and connect with her splash mountain bomb in the corner onto a car hood to put her down for the three count. Quick match here, but Rina puts a nice little bow on 2023, ending the year still your GCW ultra violent champion, a belt that she has now held for over 500 days. Bam Sullivan came to the ring on December 23rd to defend his H2O Danny Havoc Hardcore Championship against a man who recently has made his way to H2O, and that is the carnivore, Remington Roar. Let me just say, if this was a triple threat involving Waffle House, Bam would have jobbed him out. So we got some stiff forearm shots starting this match off, and then Bam was quickly slammed through a door with a half Nelson suplex. The challenger would first show his viciousness by trying to choke Bam out with a chain, and then his strength by planting Bam down through a steel chair, almost impaling him in the process. Bam would get himself right back into this match, though, with a spine buster here, a couple shots with a short ladder, and then this frog splash through a door. Maybe not the smartest idea in the world here, but Remington Roar placed a chair over the head of Bam and then would go on to deliver a flying headbutt with a chair in front of his own head. I mean, who knows? Double concussions never sounds like a good plan, but maybe that's just me. Roar would end up building this crazy contraption here with a couple ladders and some barbed wire lattice. Whatever his plan was going to be, it backfired because Bam would counter with a couple of running forearm shots and then brought Roar down onto this debris, rendering his challenger down long enough to score that three count victory. Bam Sullivan retains and will be heading into 2024, your H2O, Danny Havoc, Hardcore World Champion. 
Horror Slam hosted a Christmas horror story on December 29th, and in the main event, Chuck Stein would defend his Horror Slam Deathmatch Championship against the inaugural champion, Peter B. Beautiful. They started things off outside of the ring where light tubes came into play, but it was a staple gun that really started the craziness. Shout out to Hardcam Frio for this extreme close-up of Peter getting a $20 bill stapled to his tongue and then ripping it out. That wouldn't be the only brutal spot in this match either. Chuck took a barbed wire cricket bat right to the side of the head. Take a listen. Then they broke out of the syringes where we first saw Peter getting two right through his cheeks. Then Chuck got him shoved straight into his arms. If that wasn't bad enough, we saw another extreme close up of the champ getting his bottom lip stuck to the turnbuckle with a needle. Oh yeah, and more syringes just shoved into his arms. After a couple panes of glass were shattered, they made their way over to the ring apron where a big light tube setup was on the floor below. They both ended up falling through this contraption and failed to answer the ref's 10 count. At the time, the match was called a double count out, but Peter begged the ref to start the match. So guess what? It was restarted. But then immediately after that, Chuck went buck wild on Peter with light tubes, and then he locked in this cross face with his trusty barbed wire baseball bat. Peter had to tap out, meaning that Chuck Stein leaves 2023 still the Horror Slam Deathmatch Champion. Heading to Houston, Texas now, WrestleRave held their Holiday Havoc event on December 16th with Dmitry Alexandrov defending his WrestleRave Deathmatch Championship against Sky De La Cremosa in the main event. With the holiday spirit on full display, these two would begin by beating each other with Stana's cookie sheets, and I'm pretty sure those were children's presents. Dimitri took a nasty spill onto the ring apron, allowing Sky to staple ribbons and a couple dollar bills to the champ. Then after being choked out by some tinsel, a small sickle was used to carve into Alexandrov's forehead. Just when he thought he was getting even with this gusset plate wreath, Sky whipped out a couple of spiked baseball bats and really tried to force the champ to tap out. Several more presents were opened up around the ring with various weapons inside, including these thumbtacks, which Alexandrov ended up powerbombing his challenger onto. Sky would later chokeslam Dimitri directly onto this barbed wire Christmas tree. He would then take a bundle of tubes to the side before being hoisted up onto Alexandrov's shoulders, where the champ would march him over to the other side of the ring, slamming him down onto another pile of tubes. That right there would be enough to keep Sky De La Cremosa down for the three count. Dimitri Alexandrov closes out the year the same way he started it as the Wrestle Rave Deathmatch Champion. ICW No Holds Barred returned to the Hart Ballroom on December 16th for their Volume 56 event. In that show would be main evented by the ICW American Deathmatch Champion, Hoodfoot, defending against Dr. Redacted in their rematch from last month. No surprise here, Redacted jumpstarted the match by attacking the champ from behind with light tubes. Don't worry though, Hoodfoot would get revenge with this crazy suicide dive to the outside of the ring, catching Redacted and the fans off guard. Who pays suicide from the champ? Redacted would keep the momentum up with his trademark cannonball on the outside, and if that was enough, he would go for another one off the chains to the outside. After a while, Hoodfoot would do a number on the dock's back with these light tubes. At one point, he pulled the scrubs up over his head and just went to town on his exposed skin. The challenger would later climb up to the perch, putting his trash can over his head, and he actually landed a dive on a Hoodfoot. He's whiffed this thing so much this year that it's actually a surprise when he lands it. We then got this back and forth light tube headshot trade-off where Hoodfoot just got fired up even more. A stunner would put Hoodfoot down while Redacted capitalized with a flying headbutt and then a massive frog splash onto light tubes. But that just wouldn't be enough to get the win. Hoodfoot would rebound with his Saito suplex through a door in the corner. Then when a pane of glass got set up in the other corner of the ring, Redacted tried fighting Hoodfoot off with a gusset plate to the skull. The champ fired off a chair shot to the head and then climbed up the chains to grab onto Redacted to deliver a monster brain buster down through the glass. In a three count later, Hoodfoot retains yet again after an almost 20 minute blood battle here with the murder surgeon. At Battle of the Tough Guys on December 30th, Hoodfoot would be putting his ICW American Deathmatch title on the line in every single round of the tournament. So in round number one, he would be taking on Bojack inside the cage. 
This would be the epitome of that big hoss match with these two hitting some cage rattling slams. Hoodfoot tried time and time again to get Bojack up for his Ghostbuster, but failed almost every single time. The champ took about 90% of the punishment in this match, but he was able to dig down deep after bashing Bojack's head in. He would sidestep the challenger, sending him through the door in the corner, and then finally was able to get Bojack up for that Ghostbuster to secure the three count. Moving on to the second round, Hoodfoot would be defending his title this time against Christian Ross. Once again, Hoodfoot took the majority of the punishment here, eating a monster spear from Ross. A gusset plate and some stiff shots, though, would not keep the champ down for long. Now, the slam onto the chair, though, it looked like Hoodfoot fell on it very awkwardly, but he was able to keep going. He would connect with that Ghostbuster onto Ross through a door and multiple cinder blocks to snag the win, advancing to the third round. In the semifinals, Hoodfoot would put his title on the line against Kaplan. Now, this match right here, it would be quick. And when I say quick, I mean less than two minutes quick. Kaplan did land a lethal looking Larry here at the start of this match, but Hoodfoot kicked out. The champ immediately went for his Ghostbuster, but Kaplan got his shoulder up at one. Then right after that, he hit one more Ghostbuster through a door this time to put an end to the match. So just like that, Hoodfoot moves on to the finals to face the bracket buster, Jaden Newman. Like most of his matches in this tournament, Hoodfoot was taken down early and saw the challenger take full control of the match. Literally everything except that kitchen sink was tossed down onto Hoodfoot here. I don't recall too many gusset plates to the back of the head, but we even got to see that here. And how about a gusset plate to the hand as well? Yeah, Newman went for it all here in the finals. Eventually, it was time for the champ to jump into that driver's seat. He pulverized Jaden with a kendo stick and a thumbtack bat. Speaking of thumbtack bats, Jaden would slam one into Hoodfoot's gut and then just stomp right on the back of his head here. Not looking like he had much left, the champ would be able to turn Jaden inside out with his clothesline. Hoodfoot was nearly bleeding out here, trying to give his best, but he just kept taking strike after strike and he looked to be done for. Catching his third win here, Hoodfoot would land some stiff shots of his own before shooting Jaden up into the air and bringing him down head first in the middle of the ring with a Ghostbuster. And that would be it, folks. He weathered the storm. Hoodfoot survives four rounds, defending his title in each and every round, going on to win the entire tournament. Back-to-back -back years, by the way. When you go back and look at December as a whole, this makes for five successful American Deathmatch title defenses for Hoodfoot. So we've covered a lot of death matches this month already, but we are now going to talk about the five must-see death matches that you need to see from December 2023. One thing I've noticed, there was a lot of storylines that came to a conclusion here at the end of 2023. So some of those are going to make this list, but strap in five more matches to talk about. Let's get to them. On December 16th, ICW No Holds Bards Volume 56 event saw Danny DeMonto take on Atticus Kogar, career versus commitment. Plenty of drama has been built getting us to this breaking point. If Atticus wins, Danny's career is over. But if Danny wins, Atticus must commit to ICW No Holds Barred appearances in 2024. After the brawling outside of the ring, Danny stapled some dollars as well as some 8x10s of Atticus to Atticus. This would be a callback of Atticus accusing Danny of selling his photos for profit. This match had other story related moments with Atticus stealing moves from people already committed to ICW like John Wade Murdoch and Dr. Redacted. At one point, Atticus took Danny to all four sides of the ring, shoving skewers all over his body, including into the heart of the cold hearted player. They found their way up to the balcony where Atticus was knocked off, crashing seemingly face first through glass, landing hard on the floor. That's when 440 showed up around the ring about to help out Atticus, but ICW mainstays like Brandon Kirk, Cruel, John Wayne Murdoch, and Reed Bentley all came out to run them off. Keeping this match a one-on-one, -on -one, Danny hit his DeMonto driver, and as he was going for a second one, Kogar countered with an air raid crash through the chairs. With both men refusing to lose their end of the agreement, they just kept kicking out. But there would be no kicking out of this. Danny crotched Atticus on the chains, and then he brought him down off the top with another DeMonto driver, this one through doors and tubes. Match over, Danny DeMonto keeps his career intact as Atticus Kogar now has to commit himself to an ICW no holds barred schedule moving forward. After months and months of battling one another, the climax to the Alex Stretch and Anthrax feud finally came to a head at H2O's Torn to Shreds 2 event 
on December 23rd. Low Life Louis was brought in as the special referee for this no ropes barbed wire death match to see who would win the war between these two. The match got underway with each competitor being whipped into barbed wire, followed immediately by trading light tube headshots. Stretch was then able to gnaw away at some of Anthrax's flesh before giving him a back suplex with tubes strapped onto his back. Trying to get even after months of torment from Anthrax, Stretch dished out a ton of punishment on the outside of the ring. After taking too much time climbing up onto the ring apron, Anthrax was able to recover and slam Alex through a chair and light tubes, then strike a Zandig pose on top of it. Back in the ring, Stretch would hit a risky dive off of a half-broken ladder, driving more tubes into his opponent. While holding onto some barbed wire for dear life, Anthrax was able to grab onto Alex, pull him down through a pane of glass to the floor with a pal driver. They fought over to the other side of the ring where things worked out a little better for Stretch. This time, he connected with a crossbody, driving Anthrax back through a door and light tubes to the concrete floor. More light tubes were destroyed in the ring as these two fought for over 20 minutes, nearly to the death. At one point, Louie was taken out with a misguided light tube shot, busting him open. Anthrax capitalized on the confusion with a low blow from behind, but even after this DVD, Stretch refused to stay down. Not happy with the count, Anthrax took out little Louie, who tried filling in for his dad. A wooden barbed wire light tube frame was brought into the ring, and Alex Stretch took a brutal-looking powerbomb from the ladder down into it. Even after all of that, Stretch would be able to get his shoulder up. They would each climb up a taller ladder where Stretch would spit Fago into the face of Anthrax and then knock him off the ladder with his Viking horn. Tangled up in the barbed wire below, Anthrax couldn't move, allowing Stretch to hit a splash with light tubes across his chest. And that's when a bloody Louie counted to three, ending this brutal war between the two. Alex Stretch takes that win, and afterwards, we saw the two embrace with a hug. It also appears like Lady Blakely has forgiven Anthrax for everything that he did to her as well. This was a fitting end to to a few that has spilled damn near gallons of blood at this point. The first round of the eighth Nick Gage Invitational on December 30th saw one of the best death matches of the entire month. It would go down between Ciclope and Vilento Jack. From the very start of this match, neither guy took their foot off the pedal. We saw brutal kicks into chairs, bodies being driven into panes of glass with Christmas ornaments covering them, flesh being grinded into shards of glass, of course low blows from Jack, but once skewers got introduced, I started to get worried. I've literally seen Sage Sin Supreme be impaled with a skewer board before, so when Jack slammed it in a Cyclope, I couldn't help but cringe. If that wasn't bad enough, Cyclope would kind of curb stomp Jack into it. Then in the exact same spot that impaled Sage Sin, Cyclope hit a cannonball in the corner, driving the skewers into Jack. Thankfully, we got no major injury here. That was just the tip of the iceberg for this match because these two would keep going all out with a spine buster onto barbed wire boards, dives out of the ring, an incredible sidewalk slam through glass and cut soda cans. Sequel play hit a perfect frog splash onto light tubes, only for Jack to roll him through it and then drive him down head first with a brain buster. We got thunderous power bombs onto even more cut soda cans, broken beer bottles, and even decapitating clotheslines. None of that would put an end to this match somehow. It would end up taking one final package pal driver after nearly 15 minutes of non-stop action to finally put Cyclope away. Vilento Jack would advance to the second round of the tournament, but keep in mind everything I just showed you, those were the high spots. Everything that went down in between was just as brutal and just as smooth. I think these two snuck in a possible match of the year contender right here on the 30th. So I think it goes without saying, you can't miss this match. Daiju Wakamatsu was unable to participate in the Nick Gage Invitational due to travel issues, but the deathmatch young boy had his chance to shine as he took on John Wade Murdoch the very next night at GCW Aftermath. They got the blood flowing with trading gusset plates, but it was really the pace and brutality that had this match stand out this month. Oh, and yeah, just ignore Murdoch licking the blood off Daiju's forehead and then promptly swallowing it. Daiju would go on to headbutt not just a single tube, not just double tubes, not just triple tubes, not just four freaking tubes, but he would also headbutt six tubes into the head of his opponent. We also got massive drop kicks, massive Kaidi Sane style elbow drops, brain busters through chairs, and one of the craziest moments of the whole match was when Daiju set up a pane of glass in the corner with carpet strips on it. Murdoch would end up driving Wakamatsu face first through it. Look at this in slow-mo here. I'm talking 
face first through the glass. We also got this dangerous superplex through light tubes, and keep in mind, all of this went down in less than 10 minutes. Murdoch would lock Wakamatsu in his trademark submission maneuver, forcing him to pass out to secure the win. Just a little bit of a hunch here, but I have a feeling we're gonna be seeing more of Wakamatsu in the future. In the last death match of 2023, Japanese deathmatch legend Jun Kasai would be taking on Nick Gage one-on-one -on -one for the first time ever at the GCW Aftermath event. Now these two have fought over a dozen times, with the first being back in BJW in April of 2000, but this would be their first ever one-on-one -on -one contest and it did not disappoint. Right away, Gage would rip Kasai's forehead open with a pizza cutter. This giant blade caught Gage off guard a little bit and left him charging Kasai recklessly into the corner. It took Gage a while to recover as Kasai had him on the ropes for the first portion of this match, at times even mocking Gage. Nikki showed some signs of life as he introduced thumbtacks into the match. It was about time the man took control of this match. He rolled Kasai onto a door on the outside with panes of glass and tubes stacked on top of it. Gage then used his own body to crash down onto June. The crazy monkey would recover and shove skewers into the head of Gage before slamming him down onto a knife board and then clothesline him down on top of a razor board. As Kasai climbed to the top for his splash, he caught a bundle of tubes to the face and then had his face driven down into even more tubes with a pile driver. The staff helped Nick set up some light tube contraption in the middle of the ring, but sadly for him, Kasai countered with a massive powerbomb. Gage immediately kicked out, hitting a powerbomb of his own on Kasai, who would immediately kick out of that, so they both grabbed a couple of light tube boxes. I'm not exaggerating here, I'm talking two full boxes of light tubes, and they used every single tube on each other. Absolutely insanity. After they ran out of those two full boxes of tubes, Kasai found another large light tube bundle that he used on Gage, and that ended up opening a pretty sizable cut on Nick. June would hit one last pile driver and then finish off Nick Gage with his splash from the top rope. June Kasai takes the win as the man is left bleeding out in the middle of the ring. Now, if you ask me, I don't think Gage should ever wear this Bulls jersey again. It just seems like bad luck. This was brutal, folks, but just off its historical purposes alone, you need to go back and watch this match if you missed it. So there it is, five death matches that you need to go back and watch if you missed in December. First of all, thank you for sticking around this long and this very long episode to close out the year. I just want to say thank you to everybody who watched Jobber Radio all the way through, watched all of the deathmatch rundowns, the pay-per-view predictions, all that kind of stuff. Thank you so much. But there's a lot more to come because we are about to break out the end of year nomination video. It's gonna be coming out hopefully whenever this hits, days right after. I'm gonna release a State of Jobber radio video talking about what's gonna be coming up on the channel throughout 2024, what that means for the website, and what's gonna be going on basically throughout the next year. And yes, coming relatively soon, there will be a top 15 deathmatch wrestlers of 2023. The 2022 video is probably how you even found this channel, but don't worry, there will be another one coming out. It's in the works already. A lot of work goes into that, trust me. So for me personally, there's a lot of cool things to look forward to in 2024 in the deathmatch community. And also, I'm just gonna say, I'm excited about a lot of the stuff that Jobber Radio is gonna be doing as well. So stay tuned to the State of Jobber Radio video that's gonna be explaining kind of everything, giving a little roadmap of what's coming. But the episode has been super long. I need to end the dang thing. So please stick around to the montage right here at the end. Support deathmatch wrestling, support independent wrestling, pay the ones to do what we all love. Don't be a dick. Do not be a pirate, people. I hope you enjoyed Jobber Radio in 2023. Let's look forward to 2024. See you guys on the next video. Board. Oh my god, the moon's over the pain!